Yeah, so good that we are here and we want to start with, the, with today's service. And uh, today's, today's uh, sermon is about uh, God being with us, which is our greatest blessing. So we're looking at the, um, at the history around his second missionary um, journey that he went to. And at the start of his second missionary journey, he kind of broke up with Barnabas um, after a fight. So he partners up with a new person called Silas. And together with Silas, he travels to uh, the area of Galatians, just like in the first journey. And originally, he also had plans to go to Ephesus and also rather to the north, to, uh, to Pontus. But the Holy Spirit um, told him otherwise, so he went to Turkey instead, and he passed Troy, and he went to Europe, and then he saw an illusion, illusion or he saw a, uh, um, a vision, and in the end he went to Philippi in Macedonia, and from there he continued to uh, Thessaloniki. And there were a, cu- a couple of uh, things that happened there, he even went to prison briefly, and last week we spoke about um, the difficulties that, that Paul faced when he did his missionary trips. So there were even Jewish people who, um, who threatened him. And after some troubles, tra- uh, troubles during his journey, he ended up in uh, Athens. And Athens was a place where he thought he would um, face a high culture, but it was mixed with a lot of idol culture as well. And it didn't really went well in, in Athens. And in the end, um, not being really successful in Athens, he moved to Corinth instead. So this is briefly the, the summary of last week's service. And uh, the city of Corinth was also a, a place that was very, um, very worldly, full of a bad, um, um, very bad culture. But in that city, he didn't... Uh, Paul wasn't really intimidated by this situation in Corinth. He, he tried to see through the, those uh, situations and tried to find good people he could partner up with and good people God would send him to in the end. And um, in this situation, he meets two people, a couple co- uh, with the name Aquila and Priscilla. And through those two, again, God did his great work to build up his kingdom so what, what is the, the kingdom of God? King, the kingdom of God is, is a place where the values, uh, the values of God, his laws and regulations are in place. And this church should be a place where, where we experience God's, uh, God's nation, God's kingdom. But also our cell groups and even our families, every gathering we have with other brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the place where the kingdom of God is present. So wherever God's commandments are followed, this is the place where God's kingdom is active. So if, if a young couple marries and forms a family, this is already another start where, where God's kingdom becomes reality. So, so whenever two Christians marry, what, what will the family be like? Of course this family should be a family, a place where God's word is, um, is followed by, and it, it should be a place where God is king. So consequently, if, if, if this young couple later gets kids. So if the family grows, the, kin- the, the kids will also grow up as children of God again and also be taught by their parents about God's commandment and God's values. So if the kids grow up then, and at, at, at one point in time they have to go to school and face the world's education, and what, what do you think what happens then? They will, will suddenly be, be, uh, conf- be confronted with... Um, the opinions and the culture of, of this world outside of faith. So uh, young, young, young children are often too, too, uh, too young to understand that there is, um, there is this culture outside that is the opposite of what we learn from, from church, or what we learn in God's word. And if they go to church and first learn about uh, yeah, worldly science and worldly theories, sometimes they get troubled by that. So now this is a task for all of us. This is a task for, for us here in church. This is a task for every parent who has children. This is a task for every leader in church to educate the kids and prepare them that they are able to face every situation outside the church, outside the Christian environment, outside there in the world. So the values, God's values and God's commandments and the Christian uh, worldview has, has to be planted in the hearts. 
This is why it's so crucial that, that, that we uh, educate our kids with the Word of God, with the Bible, that they gain a basic knowledge and a good foundation of God's values. So also all the young people in church, the students and, and, and teenagers, they will know what the world is like, how different the world is, what, is compared to our Christian values. But that's why we have to, to join our forces. To, this is why we have to put more energy on, on, on learning God's word and really concentrating to learn and understand God's values. This is why we need service. This is why we need quiet time. This is why we need to read the Bible day by day and learn God's word by heart. So when Paul saw the, this, uh, this worldly culture of Corinth, he wasn't really um, overwhelmed by that. He rather met new people like Aquila and, and Priscilla. And those were, were two people who really supported him with, with all his missionary actions. So everyone here in church, every Christian, is a person who is called by God. And every, everyone who is called by God has, a, has the same mission. We all have the mission to spread God's word. This is how a healthy Christian life would be like. But that again means if, if we meet other Christians also with the same calling like we do, we can directly partner up and we can directly start to do God's work. It's not just having new friends or having a good relation to other people. The, the, the main reason why God sends us other Christians is that we can team up to do God's work and follow God's commandments. So also when, when Paul uh, met Aquila and Priscilla, they, of course, they had a good relationship, but that was not the, the, the main reason to meet each other. They started to, to, to educate and, and um, to motivate each other and to help out each other to, to grow in, in God's faith, in faith in God. And also, they, they, they teamed up to become missionaries. As a, they became a missionary team together. And Paul and, and this young couple, they started to... to, to um, make a common goal. They wanted to go together to the end of the known world and spread God's word. And in the end, um, God had different plans for Kill and Priscilla, so they, they remained in Corinth and, and did their service in that place. But still, they started to have a common goal, and this common goal was to do God's work and to uh, be missionaries under God's commandment. So whenever Christians meet, this, this becomes a very special relationship. It's, it's not just, just some people meeting up and having a good relationship and having a good time together. So, when, when, when Christians meet and when Christians team up, a, new, a very energetic force happens and, and God can use those people to, go, uh, to do his will and to, to spread his word in this world. So now the cell meetings of 2021 have restarted. So when we meet each other, it's, it's just, just that we're just meeting up because we're in the same church and we're just having some, some small group meetings. It is about becoming a team, a dream team, a team that, that will do God's work. It's about becoming co-workers or partners under God's commandment. So if we're in, in, in ourselves, look at the others, we should see people like Paul or we should become people like Silas or Timothy. We should become a dream team and also expand our dream teams. Whenever we meet new people in Christ, we should add them to our group and uh, we should um, yeah, create a holy, holy team that uh, becomes um, light and salt in this world. Um, so the next step is Paul then um, um, left Silas and Timothy in Berea and he, um, he then came to Corinth alone. And in verse 5 we, read, we can read that um, the verse 5 says, When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the other Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Next week we're going to talk about the letter Paul sent to, uh, in Thessaloniki. So it seems like Paul came to um, um, Corinth when Timothy was still in Athens. And through Timothy he, he gets the news that in Berea and, and other, in, in the church of Thessaloniki, um, there were some troubles in church. There were some, some false teachings in, in the church. This is why then Paul writes his letter and sends his letter to the Thessalon uh, Thessaloniki church through Timothy. And what we can assume about Silas is, in his case, um, he probably was at the church in, in, of Philippi, 
and um, Silas and Timothy uh, were, were um, split up for a while and did their, um, did their work uh, separately and then they all met again together with Paul, with Paul in Corinth. So j- just whenever Paul um, met his uh, co-workers or partners like uh, Priscilla and, and uh, Aquila or also Silas and uh, Timothy, whenever they came together, it was a very energetic uh, group. It was a, it was a, a very... It was a very dynamic group who, who could, when they joined forces, could do great works for God. So the same should apply to our cell groups now. From 20, we, we start the cell groups again, and when we meet in the cell groups, we should have a very positive synergy. Uh, we should be partners and co-workers under God's rule. And through the cell, we should do God's deeds. And God can do uh, great work through, through our ministry and our cell groups. And this should be our target for the year 2021 when we restart the cell groups. So through our our meetings, we we should be able to spread God's word and and get people to church and tell them what God's uh, plan for this world is. Verse 6 says, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook all his clothes and in protest and said to them, Your blood be, uh, be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So even even though Paul went to the people and gave them the good news and he wanted to to just just um, save all those people from the sin, but many people were hostile and they harassed him, and they wouldn't um, welcome him for his uh, for his message. And this is something that can happen to anyone of us. It can happen even in, in, inside our cell groups that we invite people, that we try to uh, preach God's word, that we try to um, invite them to God's family. But there can be conflicts, it, and, and it always can happen that even people from the same cell group can leave the group or leave the church because they they have a different opinion or um, they are not conforming to the word of God anymore. So this can happen to any one of us. And in many situations, the word will be hostile towards us. And if if you look at Daniel, for example, uh, when he was in Babylonia, he he still stood firmly in God's uh, God's word and and in his faith. And he continued to pray every day and continued continued to live a a worthy life, and we should follow uh, follow um, the example of Daniel as well. In this world, we should stay firm in God's word, and what we will see it is that at some point that God will start to act, and that God will be the person who will um, who will move people or put the right seed in their hearts. So, in verse seven and eight, we, um, the word says, "Then Paul left his synagogue and went to next door to the house of Tite." Uh, teaches just, uh, justice, a worship of God. Christmas, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So, therefore, never despair, never give up, because even though the word might seem hostile, even though um, your um, preaching, your, your mission work might, might seem not very efficient or very successful, at some point you will see that, that God is in the background working on some people, that you will meet the right people, or you will see that God changes hearts of, of some people uh, you wouldn't even expect. So I repeated that, that quite often recently, but um, this is why I ask you to become a dream team with, with, within your cell group, and also a good, uh, good companion, a good partner for the people. In verse 9, uh, the Bible says, One night the Lord, Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. Um, it's a bit hard to connect verse 9 to 8 because it seems to be disconnected. And uh, that's what we believe, that verse 8 to 9 is not, a, not necessarily a connected story. There might be a little time gap in between. And uh, the, the word says um, at night, but um, it could be also translated as one night. So one night after um, all the... Um, all the stories before the verse 8. So at one night, God speaks to Paul and he tells him not to be afraid. So why does God tell him not to be afraid? We can assume that God tells him not to be afraid, that he was in some trouble or that he actually was afraid and he needed God's guidance. But when we look at the Bible so far, we see that Paul seemed to be very courageous and that he was very bold to, uh, to do God's word and to do all his mission work. And um, 
he seemed always very motivated. You, you hardly could reckon that, that he was in, in some um, trouble or he, that he was afraid of his further path. And we also c- could assume that, that Paul was a person with great skills. Um, he, he was someone who was very um, skilled in, in, in preaching and in writing, and he was very well educated. But now when we read verse 9, we learn that there was a different side of Paul that we haven't maybe seen so far. Paul was also afraid. He was scared. And um, he had a hard time. He probably also had difficulties to uh, stay stable in his field of uh, ministry. And um, he probably had, had this, felt this pain of being rejected all the time. Yeah, and there, there were people who were... Uh, who rejected Paul many times, and sometimes he even uh, had to experience uh, threats against his life. And just imagine, or maybe some of you guys have experienced situations like that, like racism, or you go to some place and, and you get rejected, or um, you hear some, some racist comment, and all those situations. And if you have experienced things like that, you might maybe understand what situation or what feelings uh, Paul had at this time. So in what situation was Paul in? Just remember, for example, when we read chapter 17, when he went to Athens, and there he also tried to spread God's word. He, he also wanted to, to, um, to um, find new Christians or uh, lead people to, to, to Christ, Jesus Christ. But uh, in the end, he was not very successful with that because the people were too hostile. The people um, rejected him, and he had, he had no other choice in the end to leave Athens again and go to a different place. And this is how he ended up in Corinth instead. And, and in, in Athens he was confronted with uh, other people who were very strong um, debaters. And um, maybe we, we all thought that Paul was a very strong speaker, that he was uh, um, very good in debating. But when we read in Second Corinthians, um, in verse 6 of chapter 11, he writes as follows. He says, I may be indeed untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. So uh, Paul was very well educated, but maybe um, debating people was, wasn't the easiest thing for him. So um, the, the more we look at Paul, he was very different from, from the image that we might have in the very beginning. So if, if you're a very good looking and very uh, handsome person, um, it might be also supporting your message, could be, because the outer appearance is important. But if we, when we read of uh, when we read some records, records of someone who uh, saw Paul in the, um, at that time, uh, another scripture, we see that um, Paul was a small person. He was not, not very tall in stature. Um, and even his facial um, um, attributes were not very attractive. So he had a very bumpy and big nose. And obviously he even was almost bald because he had a severe hair loss. So if you look at his outer appearance, he was not a very impressive man. And then on the other hand, obviously his, um, his, his preaching skills were not that strong as we thought in the beginning. And what happened then as well is he obviously also was suffering from a very, very big disease. Um, it's not really clear what disease he had, but some scholars um, say that it probably might have been epilepsy. So Paul was a, let's say, not very handsome man, not very skilled in speaking and preaching, and, and a man with a very bad disease. And on the other side, the, the mission of Paul and, um, and uh, his tasks were very, very demanding. Sometimes, for example, when he had to uh, care for the church in, um, of the Corinthians, um, he was so exhausted that he almost died of exhaustion because uh, um, there was no, further, uh, no good progress in, uh, in um, developing this church. So, understanding Paul's situation better now, uh, we can assume that he was in, in his time of distress. He was uh, exhausted, he was frustrated, he was um, worried and afraid because the people kept refusing him, they kept mocking him, they kept tr- threatening him. And this is why God used the time to speak to him and told him, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So God, so God promises him that in the area of the Corinthians, in Corinth, he w- would be protected by God, and he, c- he could 
continue with his mission and God would help him to do so. So um, Paul spent quite some time, more than a year, in the Corinthian region. And in the very beginning, he was very frustrated, as, as we could see now, um, because there was no progress and, he, and there was so much host, um, um, hostility. And in that situation, God, God comes to him and um, God reaches out to him and promises him to support him, that his time in, in, in the Corinthian region wouldn't be wasted, that he would, uh, with God's support, uh, see progress and change in this area. Now, this story and this information of Paul might be surprising to us because what we could think is if Paul was someone who, who basically gave up his former life to, to, uh, to tra- travel the whole world and, and spread Jesus Christ's message. And what we would expect then in, would be that, that God would, would really um, bless him with great success, that wherever he goes, he would always be successful and we would always meet people opening their hearts to God. But that, didn't, that just didn't happen. There were situations where, where of course, many people re, uh, um, turned to God because of Paul's, uh, Paul's message. But there were other situations where he was indeed really frustrated and where he got rejected very strongly from, from people um, um, of, the, of the, those regions. So in the end, uh, what we know is um, every person, Christian or not, we all have a free, free will and God gave us to choose between God and the world. And it, everyone has the freedom to accept God or also to reject Him. This is, this is in the end, um, our freedom that, that we gain in God. And this is also a real blessing in God. But, but us, as we have decided to, 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 to follow God, God promised us to stay with us and to support us and to, uh, and, and to be with us wherever we go. Which doesn't necessarily mean that, that um, all, all our worldly problems might be solved instantly, our financial or, or health problems or whatever problem that we might face in the world. But God is still staying with us. God is with, with us and, and our eternal life is certain. And we remember in Matthew 28, before Jesus uh, returned to heaven, he promised that wherever we go until the end of the world, he always would stay with us. So... Paul, in this current situation, he's afraid, he's frustrated, he's desperate, but God reaches out to him and he um, sends his message of hope, say, uh, saying and telling him that he is with him and he would not leave his side. And also, even if, if, if this, this place where, where, where Paul was, was active at the time in Corinth, even though the, 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 um, the city seemed to be like a obscene and bad place to, to, um, to preach the gospel, in the end, um, Paul could be certain that at some point his preaching and his message would bear fruits. This is what we have to learn and understand and where we have to put more trust in God. It's, it's in the end, it's not us um, changing the people's heart. It's not the, the service, the good worship, or maybe getting new programs in church that would attract the people. In the end, it's God acting. So in the end, if, if we spread the word, uh, uh, word of God, it's, it, it is like sowing seeds, but in the end, it's God who changes the people's heart, and it's God who can cultivate people's hearts. Uh, with, with this, um, um, and we can do what we can do by, by, uh, by following God's commands and by, by spreading the word and by being good missionaries. But in the end, if a person turns to God or not, this will be decided by God himself, and we have to trust him on that point. So we are just harvesting, but the real action is done by God, and this is the, the, the um, this is the trust we have to uh, we have to have in God, and this is also the the peace we should have in our hearts when we uh, do mission work. So even even sometimes when it seems like the church is not growing, the the cell group is not growing, and our mission missionary work doesn't have any success, um, we shouldn't forget that it is God always being active, and and at some point some people will be moved by God. And it's God who actually, um, let's say, fertilizes the hearts of the people. And in the end, this is why God encourages Paul to not to be afraid and not to stay silent, but keep talking, keep spreading God's love and God's word. So on one side, we should be, it shouldn't get desperate um, if, uh, if we don't see any progress. But on the other hand, we should also uh, remember and not forget that we're living in a quite comfortable time and a comfortable place to be Christians. It would be very different if we were Christians in North Korea or, or any other um, area in this world where, 
where it is, it is risk, it is risk for your life to be a Christian, just like in, in the time when, when Paul was on his missionary trips. But maybe it is because it is too comfortable that we sometimes forget the real meaning of God's word. We get very comfortable and we, um, we call ourselves Christians, we keep calling ourselves Christians and we keep going to the church and to the services, but our hearts get filled with, with worldly thoughts and worldly desires as well. And ch- the church and our meetings should be a place where we get educated in the word, where we get prepared for, uh, uh, for, uh, for God's work. But instead, um, we can see and uh, observe a lot of churches and, re- uh, and, and uh, Christian groups that kind of get very religious and comfortable, more like a cultural thing or like a, like a gathering, like a cultural gathering rather than being a, uh, a group of uh, um, people teaming up to do, uh, to do missionary work. But if, if you're someone who's experiencing similar troubles, uh, troubles like, like Paul did, and if, if you're in distress, if you are uh, desperate, and um, if you're really willing to follow God's word and um, asking for his help to do so, you will see that, that the message God sends to Paul is the same message um, directed to, to you not to be afraid and to have trust in God because he is with us wherever we go. So how we can see Paul's life, how we can try to understand the, the, the book of uh, uh, the Acts is it is not necessary about those special people, not, not necessarily about, about Paul alone, not about uh, any disciple. It, it could be the story of any Christian, of any person who is willing to follow who is willing to, to spread the, the word of God, telling that Jesus Christ is the m- m- Messiah, that we should repent and turn to God. And at that, at that time, it, it happened that Paul or, or the other disciples, those people were the, the ones that God used at that time. But it could have been anyone. It could be um, those saints at that time who, who followed God, who did the mission, were, were, were the people like Paul, Barnabas, or Silas, and so on. But this could be the same, the, the, the same story and the same life could apply to any one of us, could apply to myself and to any one of you. And in the end, it's not us doing the work, it's God doing his work through us, through the Holy Spirit. And this is why the Holy Spirit made Paul remember um, all the things he, he had experienced uh, before. So, so he, he, he kind of asked Paul, do you, do you remember all the, the, the things that happened to you? Do you remember the previous time where, where, where I, the Holy Spirit, helped you? And it's not, it's never your skill, it's never your ability to do something, something, it's the obedience. It's the obedience that allows God to act through any person. So this is, this is important for us to understand. The, the book of Acts is not an old story about some people in the past. It's a story about any person who is willing to follow God's word. And if, if we reflect on our own lives, own lives, if, if we have the feeling that being Christian is hard, if we have the feeling that sometimes it's, it feels very alone to, to work that path, um, we, should, we shouldn't be disappointed or we should never despair. Jesus promised that he would always stay with us, he would never leave our, our side. And we should understand God is not looking for a person with great abilities, he is looking for someone who is obedient. He's not looking for the strong people, he's looking for the people who are weak in, in front of God and follow him. Because if we depend on God and not ourselves, God will be able to work through us, through the Holy Spirit, and we will see great, great things happening through our lives because we are willing to be obedient, we are willing to follow Jesus, and we are willing to give Him the space He needs to act. So in the end, through uh, God's encouragement, um, Paul regained his, his spirit, and, uh, we, and he continued to obey, he continued to do God's work. And we can read in verse 11 that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching the, the word of God. So don't forget that if we, if we meet in the church, in a cell group or whatever Christian meeting gathering we do have, there's only one main reason why we do meet. It is, first of all, to be, become born again Christians and to spread God's word to other people. And we, and we as a church, we as Christians should never put any other focus uh, to our meetings and gatherings, then this essential and this basic message God has for us and he asks us to, to spread. So in the end, the only word that should be taught in the church is God's word and nothing else and not uh, no other teaching. And because people um, um, tend to forget 
remember that in the divided kingdom of, of Israel, um, some uh, some kings started to to um, follow the idol culture, and there were reform a, a couple of times when God used people to to do some reformations. It was the same when, when in the um, mid age uh, the Catholics, the Catholic churches had um, become corrupt, and he used Martin Luther and other um, other reformers to. Uh, to put the focus back on the word and uh, to put the focus back on faith because this is in the end what, what, what God asks us to do. And we should, we should care that, that our church and that our meeting stays, stay clean. We remember when, when Jesus went to the temple and did, and, um, uh, cleaned the temple uh, from, from all sinful things. And this shouldn't be anything that happens to one of our churches. Our church, whenever Jesus comes in, whenever Jesus looks at our church, should be a clean church, should be a church that, um, um, that concentrates on work and faith. In Second Timothy uh, in chapter 4, um, the, the Bible says, In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So when we, when we preach the Bible, when we teach the Bible, we, sh- we shouldn't uh, add or, or, or change or distort the word. We should really stay on focus, uh, stay in focus and stay tied to, to God's word. Um, if, if you look, look uh, in today's world, you see that... that um, it's, it's a world of, of, of quickly changing trends. For example, fashion changes all the time. The fashion you, you wore like 20 years ago is completely different from what, we, what you wear right now. And this is normal, and you will see that the world will keep changing. But as a Christian, um, of course, you, you, to, some, to some point uh, we are living in the world, and, and to some point we are adapted to this world. But when we, when we speak about God's word, when we speak about the... Uh, when we, when we talk about the conduct of the church, it shouldn't change. It shouldn't follow any trend. It shouldn't, it shouldn't follow any, any fashion because God's word is unchanging. But you will see that, that, that people will, will uh, request other things. You will see that, that um, preaching the Bible will be very unfashionable, will be very unpopular. And people coming to church will expect to hear, let's say, comfortable words, words of comfort, words of hope, words of uh, whatever, as long as it, as it is comfortable and pleasing to, to listen to. But we should stay inside God's Word. We should, uh, and we know what, what God's, God's Word is about. We shouldn't change it in any case. So, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul stayed in Corinth for one and, one and a half years, and during the time he also wrote um, letters to the uh, Thessalonican church, and next week we will start to talk about those uh, letters he wrote. And um, yeah, that's the word for today. Let's pray.